Hello, good morning. Hello, I need to get my lighting correct. <laughs> Look at this. There's always something new. Yeah, I've got the wrong light, but you know. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, hi, Mignon. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, yeah. thank you. Lighting. Sorry, you just had surgery. I have, I've just had surgery to my knee and um i'm actually away with very dodgy wi-fi so that's why it, it may come and go during the q a but that's why i thought i would rather just do a pre-recorded presentation got it great good morning so Evelyn. Oh, is, it, is it good evening for evelyn yes yeah, good evening good Hi. evening evelyn can you hear me Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, no, it's four thirty in the morning. Oh my. God. Oh my gosh, Evelyn! Yeah, Could we not have done this at a different time? Would have been nice. Um. Oh. Um, Evelyn, it's painful. I'm sorry. Can't you go to sleep, Evelyn? Can you not just leave the the clock running? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I might. Um, I'll get your priest. I don't know. I think it's. Minyo, will she go first? Will I play her presentation first? Uh, no, or... Minyo will go at, at the last. At the, at the end. Okay. Yeah. I wondered if you could, oh, uh, if you, we shouldn't record now. We should record um, because do you edit the recording or do you just? Yes, it... I, I can edit it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. If you, yeah, we can. Um, so if you wouldn't mind giving all of us co-host property um, yeah. and that would be great because then we can control our our mic ourselves um, and then um, we should be able to let people in and out and yeah. um, do you want to try this do you want to try this because I, I on the back end I've put that multiple co-hosts are allowed I don't know, can you let Sebastian in? You... Yes, if I see him, it will pop yeah. up. Um, but we're not co-hosts yet because it will say uh, Evelyn is host. Next to our name, it will say co-host. Oh, okay, okay. So you need to change um... us to co-host. Hello, everybody. We'll catch up just now. We'll just figure out the technical bits and then we'll chat. Um, are you managing to do that, Evelyn? Yep, I'm just trying to oh, see awesome. what it is. Advanced sharing options. So if um, you click on um, the thing that says more next to my name. Oh, like up here, yep. Yeah, and it will say co-host. Okay. Oh, yes, I see it now. And if you do that for me, then... Hello, it, everyone. How are you? Oh, don't let anyone in as yet. Um, no, no. <laughs> hi, Sam. Thanks, Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Melin will join us just now. Um, but we can see people are starting to enter. Uh, perfect. So that's it, co host. Let me see if I can make. No. So only you, you can make everyone co host Evelyn as the host. Okay. Uh, so, Amelie. Oh. Zaf, Zaf, can I just ask how long are the fellows presenting for? Well, the fellows are supposed to be pre pre presenting for 10 to 12 minutes. In total or each? Each, 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 each. yeah. Okay, I'll just tell you why, is I'm actually on a, in a little game reserve and I'm sitting in the bar and everybody's gone out for a game drive. So for the next hour, I will be quiet, but uh, after seven o'clock, I can't guarantee what the noise levels will be like behind me, <laughs> but we'll just give it a go. <laughs> awesome, it's brilliant. No, that's why I was wondering whether you wanted me to go first and then the fellows present afterwards, but... No, we should do it, the, um, the fellows, and then we do the expert, and then we okay. do the I'm just, okay, no, that's It'll fine. I'm fine. just saying it, it just... Yeah. Okay, all right, good, good, just water. Um, so co-host me, co-host Emily, co-host, and uh, Evelyn, can you make the, um, 
Minion, Fahila, and Carolina as well, um, co-host. Let me text Milin. Maybe we'll start with introduction while you're texting. So thank you everybody for being here today. Sorry, we had some hiccups getting into the meeting. There's always, there's, at every meeting, I feel like there's always something that you don't think of. So uh, I'm Amelie. I think I've met uh, most of you um, either uh, in person or virtually. Um, I'm really excited that you're all here. Um, and so this is our second uh, meeting of this kind um, uh, with that, that Zaf and I did. Um, so Mignon, thank you so much for being here today as our expert speaker. Um, despite you know you being sort of on vacation and you just had some surgery, so that's really amazing that you're here. Thank you. Um, I my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so then going through the pictures here, um, next we have Fadila Teka, who is one of our PECC Kenya fellows. She's a senior fellow um, in Nairobi right now. Thank you, Fadila, for presenting your case today. Excellent. Lovely, lovely to meet you, Fadila, as well. I've heard lots of good things about you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a Thank small you. word, Fadila. <laughs> Um, and then we have Carolina Quintana, who is one of our um, pediatric uh, critical care fellows at Seattle Children's. She's also actually a trained pulmonologist, um, and she will present another case from Seattle. Sounds like you got lots of experts on this call. I'm not sure about fellows. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, Zaf, do you want to um, um, introduce Sebastian? Yes. Uh, but Sebastian can tell us um, who he is, <laughs> um, and then once once we go to the bigger meeting, um, then uh, we can do the introduction. I thought the plan. We'll wait for Milan to come, and then we'll um, discuss the plan. But Seb can tell us who he is. You want me to introduce myself? Yeah, tell the guys who you are. <laughs> okay. I am Sebastián González. I am from a tiny country in South America called Uruguay, and I'm a pediatrician here. I'm also part of a PQ network in South America, in Latin America, and I, I like to be presented just as a pediatrician. That's who I am. Yeah. Oh, but then I'm the one who's going to introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> That could be danger. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> so it's it's wonderful to uh, meet you all, and especially the the trainees. Um, and as um, uh, Amelia says, um, we have had this idea. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. The idea of um, bringing together um, trainees from a low income country, low resource country, and high resource country, giving them the opportunity to present their case and their learning in a very sort of global way while supporting um, the trainees. Um, so we will be sort of guarding the questions. Um, and we selected a, a topic that is it's, it's of great interest within the low income countries mostly, um, so that we'll be able to share experiences both in, in terms of managing and the challenges um, that our colleagues and our trainees in those part of the world um, a fine. Um, and we thought that to, to end the, the trainee's presentation and to sum it up, we'll have an expert speaker. So the last one we ran in September, we had Martin, a neighbor from um, the Netherlands, and that was absolutely brilliant. The Q's and A's is where everyone gets really excited um about and today we have Mignon who is you know I mean I've listened to Mignon many times even before meeting her in person um and her expertise in AKI PD renal everything is just brilliant um and so we're really really fortunate to have Mignon today um supporting um the expert um speaker talk um the last person that we're waiting for is um, 
uh, millions. Thanks, Zef. I'll pay you later. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and Milind is um, now in India. He was once my trainee in Birmingham, and he's returned to India after his fellowship um, program here. He is really active um, in terms of on Twitter. In, and in fact, if you guys are on Twitter, if you put your little Twitter handle like I've done mine, um, so if you go to rename and just put it and just add it, that would be great. Um, and he is now working as a consultant in Rainbow um, Hospital in, in India. Um, and his trainee um, will also be presenting her case, as you know. So what I thought is um, we could um, quick, uh, go on, Emily. Quick question. I think Carolina has some problems with the audio. Can we just test that real quick? Oh, Audio. Go on. Can you unmute yourself, Carolina? Yeah. Can you guys hear oh, me now? It's working. We can hear you yes. perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Yay. Yes. Um, nice to meet you all. Sorry, it wasn't oh, working. Uh, Evelyn, can you um, tick on the slide share, the screen share to multiple participants? So the second one after one. So that they. Do we they... have the WIFPIC? Do we have the WIFPIC slide? One participant can cheer at a time. Um, and that would be only you, the host. So you need to go to multiple participants. Multiple. So, yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah, uh, and then do you have the sort of with big slide? Hi, Usha. Hi, Zaf here. Um, we were just um, meeting everyone just now. Um, we're waiting for Milind. Um, so do you want to quickly introduce yourself for the group? Yeah. Uh, hi, Dr. Jeff. I am Dr. Usha Nandini. I am doing my senior, uh, uh, I'm a senior pediatric critical care fellow in southern part of India. So I'll be finishing my course in another two months. So I'll be going for taking exams in Jan next year. Basically, I, here I was doing fellowship for last two years. So that's it. Excellent. Um, Usha, can you, where is Melind? I can't see Melind in the, the waiting list. So what we will do is, I'll give a little preamble to the goal here, um, and then um, uh, we'll, who, in terms of presenters, who are we, who, how would you guys like to present? In what order? So should we go Fahila, Usha, Carolina? Is that okay? Sure, sure, okay. Okay, um, so then it, Fahila, Usha, Carolina. And um, Milin, who has now arrived, um, will introduce um, Usha. Uh, Amelia will introduce Fahila and then Carolina. Um, and we'll do a very short introduction just because we, we're mindful of time. And then I will do the introduction for Mignon um, just before the presentation. But at the beginning of the session, it's two minutes when we let everyone in. I'll introduce the, the goal of what we're trying to do. I'll introduce Amelie and Milin and Sebastian um, as the main panelists. Um, and then we'll start the presentation. Seth, Seth, can I just ask, are you going to play my presentation as well? Um, Evelyn is going to play your presentation. Oh, Evelyn's going to do great. Yeah, Fantastic. Because she's stuck okay. it out no, no, um, no. already. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Fantastic. Um, so it's exciting. We have quite a few people who are signing in. Um, they're coming up, up, up. Um, I think sometimes people forget the time difference. <laughs> um, and please feel free to tweet. So I know Sabi and uh, Milin are Twitterates. Um, so if you guys can tweet. Um, and if you hashtag with fix 22, um, that would be great as well. Oh, awesome. So if you can put that into presenter mode, 
Um, that would be great. And then once we're not speaking, um, we'll put ourselves on mute because the feedback can sometimes be a bit um, echoey. Any questions? And, and don't be scared, guys. It's really a wonderful experience and exposure um, to be able to present this you know, to a global audience. Um, and Amelia, myself, Mignon, uh, Melin, and Sebastian um, would be monitoring the chat rooms and um, managing the questions and stuff like that. Um, and just one more thing, Melin, um, Amelie, before we um, allow the um, audience in, have you put everyone on mute? Um, when they enter? Yes, that should be uh, all on mute. Yeah. Awesome. And you've turned the time. Enter, yeah. And the time is off because we didn't hear when the other guys have come no. in. No. Yeah. Perfect. You are absolutely amazing. Okay. So I suppose we should let people in. Good luck, everyone. Uh, you know, I'll be great. The numbers are shooting. Hello and welcome everyone. It's amazing to see so many colleagues from the global community um, that has an interest in pediatrics critical care. Um, my name is Zaf um, and some of you might know me. And today we I'm joined by a number of colleagues um, on the panel and three wonderful presenters, um, our junior doctors from around the world. Um, I will let the, my colleagues introduce the speakers, but first I want to say thank you very much um, for attending the session today. Um, remember, this is a junior doctor presentation, and here we are here to learn and share our experiences. So please engage by putting your question and comment um, into the chat box. I would like to introduce my, I like to call her my partner in crime, Amelie. Um, Amelie and I first thought about um, doing something to improve education specifically for low-income countries around the world in pediatrics critical care and we came up with this sort of education theme um, that we select a topic um, every three months. Um, in September as some of you will remember we did um, pediatrics ARDS and we had our expert speaker joining um, trainees from low-income and high-income country. Today, I'm, we are also joined by Sebastian Gonzalez, who is a pediatrics intensivist, although he likes to say that he's a pediatrician. Um, and he's joining us all the way from South America. Um, he says it's a small country called Uruguay, but I'm sure the population there is probably much larger than many other countries. Um, Sebastian is also the chair for the um, Latin America Collaborative Network um, of Pediatrics Critical Care. And he's also an adjunct professor of pediatrics critical care in the Faculty of Medicine, Universita de la Republica. Um, you see, my Spanish is excellent. Um, and he is also a member of the editorial board and social media ambassador for the Pediatrics Critical Care Journal, and also the co chair for the WIFPIX Research Committee. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for joining us today. I also have Milin Jambari, who was a previous trainee at Birmingham Children's Hospital for the fellowship program. And now Milin has returned home to India, where he is a pediatrics intensivist. Milin is also actively involved in WIFPIX um, uh, from a sepsis point of view. And we also have our expert speaker, uh, Mignon, who I shall introduce just before um, her talk. So again, welcome very much and thank you for participating today. Um, I will hand the floor over first to Emily 
so she can introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Amelie St. Andre, and I am really excited to um, introduce our uh, senior fellow, um, Dr. Fatila Teka from Tanzania, who is currently um, going through our Pediatric Emergency and Critical Care Fellowship in Kenya. Um, she is originally from Tanzania, where she did her medical school in Dar es Salaam um, at Muhambili, um University. And then she did her pediatrics training at Chongji Medical College of Huazong University um, in China. And then um, she worked some time in Tanzania and um, recognized that she wanted more training to take care of critically ill children. And so we are very fortunate to have her um, in Nairobi in our PCC Kenya Fellowship. And um, she will present a case of acute kidney injury uh, from the ICU at University of Nairobi at Kenyatta National Hospital. And I'm really excited um, for her presentation. Thank you, Fadila. Thank you. Can I share my slides? Yes, please. Uh, as I've already been introduced, my name is Fadila Teka. I'm a pediatric emergency and critical care fellow at the University of Nairobi. I'm being trained at the Kenyatta National Hospital, which is the largest tertiary referral hospital in, um, in Kenya. Uh, in the hospital, we have a pediatric ICU with five beds and where we admit all the critically ill patients who are all um, referred from different facilities and some are uh, patients who are admitted in the hospital and they get uh, they got deteriorated. So since we have a large number of patients that need critical care management, some children are admitted in the adult ICU and they are managed there. So today I would like to share with you a case of, sorry, I would like to share with you a case of SM, a seven months old male with no, uh, who, who was previously well presented with fever and blood diarrhea for seven days and had a reduced urine output for two days with no discomfort in urination and no blood in urine, was referred from another health facility with where he was admitted for five days, was given IV medication with no improvement, but, further, uh, but later he was referred to our facility for, for further management and evaluation and possible nephrology review. So this kid, this child had a normal natal and postnatal history, had unremarkable past medical history, had received all the immunization uh, which was needed, and uh, family social history uh, had no any congenital or hematological disease in the family. On examination, the child was pale, lethargic, and had petechi on the upper torso, had signs of uh, dehydration, was tachycardic, tachypnic, saturating 89% in room air and uh, was having fever with temperature of 38.5 degrees Celsius. On systemic examination had fast deep breathing, had uh, signs of shock and of not the GCS was eight over 15. So we had an impression of hypovolemic shock, ruling out septic shock and AKA secondary to sepsis or hypovolemia and anemia as our third diagnosis. So the patient was admitted in pediatric ICU, was intubated and mechanically ventilated uh, because of low GCS and hypoxemia, was bolused with ringers lactate two times while awaiting for blood and later was transfused with packed red blood cells. Investigations were taken and later started with a broad spectrum antibiotics. So later we are able to see the lab results. As you can see, the white blood cell count were elevated with the predominance of neutrophils, had normocytic normochromic anemia with a HB of 7.9 grams per deciliter and platelet of 55, which were markedly reduced. Potassium, urea, and creatinine were all elevated. The coagulation studies were normal, had uh, hyper, uh, 
hyperbilirubinemia and the LDH levels were also high. The blood gas analysis showed a picture of uh, metabolic, uncompensated metabolic acidosis and the peripheral blood smear showed reduced platelet number with schistocytes which were noted. Of note, malaria was negative. The stool analysis and culture was negative, direct comb test was negative, and blood culture was also negative. But remember, this kid came from another hospital where he was already been treated several times with uh, antibiotics. And so that might be the reason why we had negative stool culture, stool culture and blood cultures. So after the lab results, we had a diagnosis of hemolytic uremic syndrome because of the presence of acute kidney injury, uh, micro, signs of microangiopathy, hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia. Of course, we had other differentials of sepsis and septic shock and hypovolemia, hypovolemic shock. So in a study which was done in Kilifi, in one of the rural district hospitals in Kenya, they reviewed retrospectively children who were admitted with HUS in their facility. And uh, they reviewed all the laboratory data and clinical cause of the disease and came to find out that 68% had diarrhea, while the diarrhea negative HUS patient had, had more severe disease compared to the one who had diarrhea. The commonest organisms were Shigella and E. coli, while um, they were isolated from stool and blood respectively. The mortality was very high at that time, which was about 55% for all those who were admitted, and their severe hyponatremia was a significant predictor of mortality. So the suggested management of uh, Hemolytic uremic syndrome is mainly supportive, uh, being careful with the fluid management. Once the patient develops hemolytic uremic syndrome, they are likely to develop fluid overload because of oliguric kidney injury. And as we all know, the uh, positive, I mean, the fluid overload is a, a predictor of, uh, is a bad prognostic factor for critically ill children. Uh, so, in the fluid management, we have to limit uh, fluid balance in a very tight range. Also, there is a correction of electrolyte in, in, uh, in, uh, in supportive management, since these patients usually present with uh, electrolyte imbalance secondary to, vomit, uh, secondary to gastroenteritis. And uh, also, we are talking about blood products uh, transfusion. Here in blood product transfusion, we are mainly talking about the red blood cell transfusion, as these patients usually <laughs> present with severe anemia. Um, which usually compromise their respiratory and cardiovascular function. So they need to be supported by, by transfusing the packed red blood cells. Of note, every, uh, if there is no, unless we have evidence of active bleeding, platelet transfusion is not uh, is contraindicated in these patients because platelet transfusion can enhance the thrombotic event and exacerbate the condition. Uh, they normally present with uh, uh, profuse diarrhea, but again, the anti-peristaltic -peri uh, agents are not uh, contraindicated because they have, they have shown to increase the risk for systemic complication. So does the antibiotics for E. coli infection. These are, uh, have been shown to cause even more severe illnesses because of the lysis and, uh, and uh, release of toxin in the gut, which cause even more severe infection. But in, um, in a study which, uh, in a consensus guideline which was published for the management of, uh, sorry, for the management of hemolytic uremic syndrome in developing countries, they suggested and recommended uh, the use of uh, antibiotics for Shigella. But since uh, clinically you can differentiate the Shigella infection from the E. coli infection, they suggested to give antibiotics for Shigella for every patient who is admitted with bloody diarrhea. Now, those are uh, some of the contradicting uh, results, but uh, the first one uh, encouraged the use of uh, 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 this, um, encouraged the use of antibiotics only for, for, for shigellosis, while the previous one uh, prevented the use of uh, antibiotics for, 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 for the other one. In uh, management of these patients with HUS, Renal replacement therapy is indicated, especially because uh, of the AKI which they have, and more than 70% of these patients need renal replacement therapy. Uh, there are some challenges which 
we face in our setting. First of all, our patients usually present very late for, for in health facilities, which cause late diagnosis, but also um, there are very few centers in our in our setting that can do dialysis but even those few centers like in our center we are only uh, we can only do the peritoneal dialysis but we can do the hemodialysis because there are no machines for which allow small blood volumes for patients with a, for very young children and also there are the venous access uh, there are no catheter small catheters for pediatric patients so at the end of the day children who are less than 20 kg can only depend on peritoneal dialysis now even the peritoneal dialysis there are inconsistent availability of dialysate fluid so in our part, our nephrology team have uh, find a way towards this, uh, around this, by doing uh, improvisation of the, by making the local prepared fluid at the bedside using the commercially available IV fluids. So in some settings, uh, the clinician are against the use of it because they, uh, they feel like it has more complication uh, together with the electrolyte imbalance. But there are some studies which have been done that showed how safe they are and how effective they are. Like in a study which was published in, from, which was done from South Africa, where they aimed to look at the safety and efficacy of bedside prepared PD fluids, where they assessed, where they reviewed 49 patients who were treated using locally prepared peritoneal dialysis fluid. And, um, with, uh, because of different causes. And they found out that the complications, which are peritonitis and blocked tubes were very minimal. So, and there are no electrolyte imbalance, I mean, disturbances which were reported. So at the end of the day, they uh, concluded that locally prepared PD solutions can be used safely and effectively. In another study was done in uh, Cameroon, where they aimed to compare the locally produced solutions and the commercially prepared uh, solutions, where they came to find out that in the two groups, the rate of complications, which is mortality and peritonitis, are both equal from the locally prepared solutions and the commercially prepared solutions. So they came with the conclusion that locally produced PD solutions with locally available tubings have some mortality and peritonitis rate same compared to the, I mean, uh, between, the, between the two. Uh, in um, ISP, uh, the current ISPD, uh, ISPD guideline, recommend the use of tank of catheter inserted by a surgeon in theater as an optimum choice of uh, PD, catheter, uh, PD catheter access. But then if it, uh, the, this optimum, uh, the standard PD catheter is not available, the improvised catheters, uh, uh, they, are, they recommended the use of improvised PD catheters. And the catheters which they're talking about are things like Foley's catheter. In some centers, they have used Foley's catheter and reported its, um, how successful it was. The NGT catheter, the NGT, and uh, also the chest tube catheter. So any catheter that can give access to the peritoneal, uh, peritoneal cavity can be used for peritoneal dialysis in places where there's no access for uh, to these standard PD catheters. Also, commercially prepared solution is the preferred one according to them, but then if it's not present, the locally made solutions can be used following sterile preparation to avoid complications like peritonitis and others. Mm, so what happened to our patient? Now, despite adequate fluid resuscitation, our patient continued to deteriorate. The urine output was still low. The electrolytes continued to be imbalanced, especially the potassium uh, continued to be high. The patient continued to be in metabolic acidosis. So uh, the decision to dialyze a patient was made. And the pediatric, uh, pediatric surgical team helped in insertion of uh, PD catheters. In our center, the PD catheters are inserted in theater with the pediatric surgical team. Uh, before that, they inquired the uh, transfusion of platelets because the PD uh, because of the risk of bleeding and how low the platelets were at that time. The antibiotics were given just prior to the insertion of the PD catheter. So we used a uh, 1.5 dialysate fluid, which was mixed using Ringer's lactate and dextrose at the bedside, 
We used a lower concentration because our patient didn't have fluid overload, so they didn't need a very high concentrations. We aimed at one hour cycle, which was which were which we aimed for a filling time of five minutes, dwell time of 30, and draining time of 25, aiming for 24 hour cycles uh, within uh, within 24 within 24 hours. We monitored our urea, creatinine, and all the electrolytes. At, we did the continuous dialysis for continuous three days, I mean, four days. As you can see from day three is when we started the dialysis and we can see the first drop of serum creatinine and urea after beginning of peritoneal dialysis. So the dialysis was done for four days. At the end of four days, the patient had a good urine output, had uh, normal uh, levels of urea and creatinine, the potassium and sodium were all at the normal uh, at the normal ranges, and the patient was able to be discharged home at day nine of admission. So, in conclusion, HUS is one of the causes of AKA that is high mortality unless diagnosed and managed early. Peritoneal dialysis is a well acknowledged and established form of acute renal replacement therapy, but for our setting, it is the only means of renal replacement therapy that exists, and that small children depends on it because we can't do hemodialysis for our young children. Now in the setting with limited availability of PD equipment, improvisation of PD catheter and dialysate solution, solutions can be done safely with greater efficacy as we have already seen in other, in other studies which have already been done. Thank you. Thank you, Fahila. I'll ask Melinda to introduce Usha, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Milin Jambagi. Uh, I would uh, like to introduce Dr. Ushanandini DK, who is uh, one of our pediatric critical care medicine trainees from India. Uh, she is currently working as a second year PICU trainee at Rainbow Children's Hospital, Bangalore, India, which is in the southern part of India. And after completing her MBBS from Karnool Medical College uh, in Andhra Pradesh, she has done her post graduation. Uh, which is GNB Pediatrics uh, from CSI Hospital Mysore in India. And now she's working as a second year PICU trainee at Rainbow Children's Hospital, uh, Bangalore. So uh, I would like to ask uh, Usha to start her presentation and share uh, their experience on management of AKI uh, in their hospital. Um, thank you, Milin, sir. Are my slides visible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Usha Nandini. Uh, I'm doing my second year pe uh, pediatric critical care fellowship in Rainbow Children's Hospital, India, Bangalore, India. Basically, I'll be presenting a case of acute kidney injury. How or what are the challenges we faced in managing the child in low and middle income countries like us? So this is the place where I am working currently. So this is Rainbow Children's Hospital Rainbow in Bangalore. So it is located in the southern part of India, in the state of Karnataka. Ours is a 200-bedded pediatric hospital with 24-bedded tertiary care PICU center. Approximately, we'll be having 1,200 admissions per year. And uh, here we, we provide services with all modalities of ventilation, kidney replacement therapy, and VBACMOS. So first of all, I would like to thank all the moderators and mentors for giving me this opportunity to present this case of six years, eight months old girl in this platform. She presented to us with the pain in her right, uh, right wrist and the restricted movements, which was very transient, which subsided with one dose of paracetamol. Next day, she started having fever, which was also transient, which uh, with one dose of paracetamol, it got subsided. Uh, day three, she was fine. Day four, she had pain abdomen and vomiting for which she was taken to a primary center where they were, uh, she was evaluated. She has thrombocytopenia and uh, dengue rapid was done, which was non-reactive. She was referred to her other centers in view of her clinical manifestations and thrombocytopenia, where she was admitted. Next day, she again had fever and uh, she was continued to have dropping platelets and her CRP was very much elevated. Apart from that, her kidney and liver parameters were normal. So she was started with IV fluids and uh, ceftriaxone and amikacin in the outside hospital. The platelets were continuous to be dropping and her ultrasound abdomen was showing features of fluid leak. She was transfused with one unit of uh, platelets and uh, over time her sensorium started worsening. So she was referred to higher center for the present reason and on day seven child came to us. In ER she was unstable but she was not life-threatening and uh, with primary neurological dysfunction her GCS was around 9 by 15. Uh, we consider the probable diagnosis of uh, febrile encephalopathy. Being a tropical country, uh, if any child present with these kind of manifestations, our first diagnosis will be sepsis. Second, post this 
COVID pandemic, we are seeing a lot of children with these manifestations and with MISC. Uh, MISC, why we considering this child? Because the uh, clinical history of prolonged fever, altered sensorium, and her total counts were slightly on the elevated side with the lymphopenia and CRP being very high. So we considered MISC as our diagnosis. In our setup, we will be seeing a lot of rickets cell fevers, which is a very close mimic of MISC again, and dengue fever. Uh, but the points are not very favorable for dengue because of, again, uh, we quite quite often we don't see so much of lymphopenia and uh, elevated CRPs in dengue. With this diagnosis in mind, we stabilized her in ER and the CECT brain was done and she was shifted to PIC for further management. We repeated the investigations. What we can make out here is her total counts are very much elevated with more of neutrophilic predominance. Her platelets were continued to be dropping despite uh, receiving platelet transfusion. Her CRP was very significantly elevated. ESR was normal. Her electrolytes were fine. She had elevated urea creatinine. Her liver functions and coagulation profile was deranged. Her venous blood gas was showing metabolic acidosis with lactates were also on the higher side. And as, because uh, we considered MISC also as one of our differentials, we evaluated for hyperinflammatory markers like ferritin, LDH, D-dimer, and proBNP. Everything came positive. And COVID serology was positive for IgG antibodies. Ultrasound abdomen, again, it was showing uh, features suggestive of fluid leak, and uh, CECT brain was unremarkable. So coming to her course in PICU, we uh, started the child with meropenem and amikacin. Because rickets cell fever was also our diagnosis, we started her uh, on doxycycline too. Her hemodynamics were initially stable, but her sensorium kept on worsening. So around four hours of PICU stay, we intubated her with modified RSI, and we started her on pressure control mode of ventilation. Initially, we didn't have much problem in uh, ventilating the child. We were able to achieve quite good oxygenations and tidal volumes. Around eight hours, she developed hypotension. We did bedside echo, which was showing mild LV dysfunction, but it was not very significant. We started her on noradrenal infusion, initially with 0.05 mics, and uh, gradually we had to increase up to 0.1 mics based on her hemodynamic monitoring and uh, arterial blood pressure monitoring. Considering MISC, we started her on methylprednisolone pulse dose, and we repeated the investigations. Blood gas was almost normal, and serum lactate was also in decreasing trend. Over time, she developed uh, bleeding manifestations for which we have stabilized her, and we continued to do neuroprotective measures and non-invasive neuromonitoring. So the issues what we encountered in the first 24 hours were her PF ratios and oxygenations were worsening. So in, uh, we can see in this graph, initially her PF ratios were more than 200, but over time it came to less than hundreds. So, and her pressure requirement also kept on going high. And in, uh, inotropic requirement was worsening and fluid overload. Actually, uh, Considering her previous hospital records, she was already fluid positive, positive by 6%. And in our hospital, in the next 24 hours, her urine, she was passing urine, but we were not able to achieve so much of euvolemia. And finally, she landed up in 10% of fluid overload. And AK stage 2. Why I'm saying is like, if we can remember the previous investigations, her creatinine was 0.3. And the creatinine has increased by more than two times within a span of 48 hours. So according to Akin criteria, she was fitting into AK stage two. And her other uh, like uh, issues were like leukocytosis, thrombocytopenia, and hypoalbuminemia. Coming to the course continue, we can see in this X-ray after 24 hours, we can see completely white out lungs and a moderate amount of pleural effusion on the right side. So she was developing more and more pulmonary edema. We repeated her labs. What we can make out here is hemoglobin is slightly on the higher side. Total counts were also going high, but her urea creatinine were significantly increasing trend. And her urine output started coming down over time. Uh, at the same time, she was accumulating more fluids and her urea and creatinine were also in raising trend. So I would like to ask how many people will just slightly consider uh, going for kidney replacement therapy at this point? So let us discuss what we did. So even if we want to start kidney replacement therapy also, what mode of replacement therapy will start? There are two modes like peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. Which mode? And machine. Basically, in uh, uh, in resource-limited settings, getting the CRRT machine itself is a difficult thing. So which machine we will use? What filters like high-flex or low-flex dialysis? And based on the mode, what we are choosing, like all the dialysis dose, everything. And how much fluid we are planning to remove from the child and the anticoagulation of choice. So keeping all these things in mind, so the problems what we encountered in the child was fluid overload with worsening RFTs. But the good things in this child was hemodynamics was stable and blood gases were normal and no diselectrolytemia. Ideally, we could have started CRRT in this child considering her poor sensorium and she was on ventilator, inotropic requirement. But again, we wanted... Uh, 
we use a lot of echo in our unit. So we did hemodynamic evaluation, both clinical parameters, and we did an echo. Her IVC was considerably full, and her heart chambers were also looking uh, like full volume. We did renal Doppler. Renal perfusion was okay, and her renal uh, flows were all looking good. With the renal resistive index was normal. So we gave a trial of albumin Lasix infusion, and we can we observed the child for next four hours. Over four hours, she was passing urine, but uh, we were not able to achieve whatever the negative balance what we wanted. And this, uh, in addition to that, her urea and creatine has significantly increased in within 12 hours to almost like uh, the values have significantly gone up. So at this point, we had persistent fluid overload, worsening RFTs. On top of that, it was becoming extremely difficult for us to ventilate the child. So ideally, at this point, we should have started the child on CRT. But again, because of the financial constraints and other parameters, because the child was remotely stable and uh, normal blood gases, we uh, were forced to start on like low efficiency hemodialysis, like intermittent hemodialysis baslet. We were thinking what to start. But uh, the concern here was if at all we start the child on intermittent hemodialysis, already this child is having food sensorium. On top of that, if you do hemodialysis, the sensorium may like worsen because of the rapid fluid shifts in the brain. The child can just cone and herniate. So at this point of time, we did her neuromonitoring non-invasively by using optic nausea diameter and transcranial flows. Her transcranial flows were good with bidirectional flow and RA and PAs were normal. And her optic nausea diameters were also around 0.4. Once we were reassured that she is not uh, her sensorium, uh, like her cerebral edema is not worsening and she's not in raised ICP situation. We started the child with uh, like a few modifications of intermittent hemodialysis and fluid removal. So here we use low flex filter with co-current flow. Basically hemodialysis will be going with high flex filters and counter current flows, but we didn't want the urea and creatine to drop significantly in this child. So we, we had to do so many modifications. Uh, the main issue was because of the financial constraints. If we start the CRRT, that itself one day CRRT charge will just cost around the total hospital stay for the child. We did this modality for uh, duration of four hours and we were monitoring the child. So this is uh, the parameters of fluid overload and uh, urea and creatine, what happened in the next 24 hours, which I discussed. Coming to the course continued. So here in on day three, we had one more problem. That means hemoglobin previously it was 13, which has significantly dropped to 8.2. And platelets were persistently on the lower side. So at this point, we were considering whether the child is going for thrombocytopenia associated multi-organ failure, TTP spectrum. So in our tropical countries with a lot of sepsis and scrub typhus, we see a lot of time of uh, TTP spectrums. But here, the positive points were like her LDH when she came, it was 700, but her LDH was 350. The TTP spectrum was not that high. And peripheral smear was also showing cystocytes, but it was just 2%. Keeping that thing in mind, we were continuing with other monitorings. So here, still on day three, the child continued to be fluid overloaded by cumulative of 14%. So we had to start on scuff for the fluid removal. Post to 24 hours of her like uh, in first session of intermittent hemodialysis, we repeated her parameters. We were able to achieve fluid removal, but her urea and creatine has slightly gone up. So for the ongoing scuff, we have added one more short session of intermittent hemodialysis. And meanwhile, we got other reports. So Reptifus IgM came negative, so we stopped doxycycline. And at the end of day three, for 20 with 24 hours of scuff, we were able to re remove two. 0.3 liters of fluid from the child and the child also tolerated well and she was hemodynamic stable throughout the course and from 14 percent of the cumulative fluid and what are the issues were encountered in day four like uh, she was continued to have a ventilator support but her uh, pf ratios were reasonably wide uh, stable on kidney replacement therapy but her hemoglobin and platelets were further dropping down and she developed new onset of purpura if we can see from these slides uh, on her hands and uh, her shin, her, her knees, she's having purple color rash, nothing but purple of fulminants. And one more point, what we can make out from these slides, in spite of removing so much of fluid, still she's having a lot of subcutaneous edema. So we reconsidered our diagnosis to multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children versus severe sepsis with thrombocytopenia associated multi-organ failure with TTP spectrum involving both brain, kidney, and liver. We continued the mechanical ventilation and we were uh, continued to remove the fluid, remove, uh, remove the fluid through scuff. And day four, because 
even though her LDH was not on the higher side because she developed this new onset purpura, her hemoglobin was on the lower side and uh, her platelets were continuous to be on the lower side. We repeated the peripheral smear again. This time her cystrocytes have increased to more than 5%. Keeping the TAM of TTP spectrum in her mind, we uh, we started the child on double volume plasma exchange, which is like one of the best treatment modalities for TTP. So at the end of day four, we were able to remove 1.4 liters and the child with, was cumulatively positive by just 6%. Initial days, initial day when we started this cuff, we targeted to make the child u volumic. After that, we targeted to remove more and more fluids to make the child considerably negative. Next day, we continue with single volume plasma exchange and we remove 1.4 liters again. So the child again, uh, fluid overload percentage dropped to 4.4%. And we tapered the methyl prednisolone, and she's had hypertension for which we had to start her on androdipin. On day six, again, we repeated the third session of single volume plasma exchange. And without, uh, we stopped the scuff on day five itself. On day six, the child spontaneously had native kidney functions are improved, and she spontaneously dies around 1.3 liters of urine, and she was uh, like significantly in the normal u volume range. On day six, we had to uh, do uh, again a short session of intermittent hemodialysis. Her LDH activity was fine. Day seven, finally, we were successfully able to extubate the child and she was off therapeutic plasma exchange and off kidney replacement therapy. On day 10, we shifted the child on antihypertensives, antibiotics, and tapering doses of steroids without any need for further renal replacement therapies. So if we can see the TTP activity, this is how it evolved. And cumulative fluid balance percentage on day one, she was 10%. And it increased to 14% of the cumulative fluid balance. Once we started this cuff, we were able to achieve euvolemia. And in, in spite, actually, we went to negative fluid balance. So this is a slide which is highlighting all the her renal parameters and where are we did the interventions. So I think all these things I have explained. Coming, take home messages from my presentation, what I would like to give uh, for everyone who is attending this webinar is conventional kidney replacement therapy indications might underutilize the need for kidney replacement therapies in PICU. And fluid overload is a very, very important indication for kidney replacement therapy in multi-organ dysfunction. Intermittent hemodialysis bar SLED, can, SLED is low, uh, low efficiency dialysis, can be an inexpensive alternative for continuous renal replacement therapy in low income settings. And TTP time of spectrum needs to be recognized as one of the most common causes for AKI in sepsis with the multi-organ dysfunction. And therapeutic plasma exchange is a very, very useful tool to treat time off. Finally, I would like to conclude my, thank, my talk by thanking all my teachers and my patients. And thank you. Thank you very much, Prusha. That was a fantastic talk. Um, please do put the questions in the chat box. Um, we'll get to them in a bit after the presentation. And I'll hand over to Emily to introduce um, Carolina. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Zav. Yeah, I'm very excited to introduce now one of our fellows from Seattle Children's. Um, Carolina Quintana is originally actually from Colombia and um, did her uh, residency training in Connecticut. And she's not only a pediatric ICU fellow, but she is already a trained pulmonologist. She did her fellowship in uh, pediatric pulmonology um, at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. And um, she is now one of our senior uh, pediatric critical care fellows at the University of Washington in Seattle Children's. And we are so excited um, to have her present today. Thank you so much, Carolina. Carolina, we need you need to unmute. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes, but I think you've using two screens, so I'm just seeing myself <laughs> rather than the presentation. Okay, can you guys see my slides now? Yeah. I can see your slide. Just go to perfect presentation mode and we can hear you. Thank you. 
Perfect. Sorry about that. I was having some technical difficulties. Emily, thank you so much for introducing me and thank you everybody for giving me this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and I'm going to talk about acute kidney injury in heart disease, particularly after cardiac surgery, um, kind of our experience here at Seattle Children's. Um, so big things I'm going to talk about our case. I'll talk a little bit about physiology. I'll talk about implications after cardiac surgery in, in relation to acute kidney injury, and then I'll give you guys some conclusions. So our case, this is a nine-year-old male. He had a VSD and an interrupted aortic arch repaired as a newborn, and he was readmitted to us uh, for repair of his subaortic uh, stenosis, and he had something called a Roscona procedure, where basically they um, used his pulmonary uh, valve and replaced it um, in the arch uh, aortic position and then adjusted or attached the coronaries. Um, his procedure was complicated by a very long um, cardiopulmonary bypass time of 661 minutes with a cross clamp time of 40, 426 minutes. Um, and he had pretty significant aortic um, arch tissue friability, so he required an arch augmentation and repair. Um, and then of note, after he um, had his repair, he had pretty significant hypotension. Unfortunately, his case was complicated by needing to be on ECMO 24 hours after the procedure. He had developed atrial tachycardia and some concerns about his right coronary artery, and he was on ECMO for two weeks. Um, his course has been very complicated, including having necrotizing pancreatitis and significant AKI, for which I'm presenting him today. Um, he also remains um, intubated with significant respiratory failure that we've been slowly weaning. Uh, he's been pretty deconditioned, but is doing much better now. So for him, big things that happened after all this very complicated situation, he um, had significant fluid overload, um, but he's slowly been able to wean. And then we had a period where he had a significant decrease in his urine output with increase in the urine and creatinine. Um, but we have kept him on a Lasix drip um, since surgery because he's been able to achieve despite all of this. Um, and then we did not consider using CRT. We are very lucky that we do have those technologies here, uh, but in this case in particular shows that not necessarily um, had to start it on him. Um, so this is a graph of his um, renal markers. So as you guys can see from initial admission, his urine has been high. It did take a hit as high as 80 at one point where he had pretty significant decrease in his urine output that we had to like just supportively manage. Um, and then he had pretty significant uh, increase in creatinine. I know this is very small, but um, it was as high as 1.4 immediately post surgery. And then it bumped again to point eight. It's now much, much improved. Uh, and it's been um, more in the point three range. And then this was um, when he was having issues with high view and current in, in that peak in the middle part where he uh, was having decreased urine output. However, if you guys can see the very small numbers here, this is a cumulative fluid balance, but overall he has been able to recover from a urine output perspective um, and has had pretty significant um, fluid um, exchange where we've been able to get as, as high as four liters, two liters, three liters, um, and daily, uh, even though he was having decreased urine output. And then this is something just to show you guys that we uh, had, had him on, this was when we were having issues with his urine output. Uh, we've been having him on a Lasix infusion um, and then the doses that he had been get, getting uh, throughout that course were from 62 milligrams up to 373 milligrams total in 24 hours. Um, so he was in pretty high doses of Lasix and despite of that um, had been, and was able to recover. So uh, jumping a little bit into physiology, I know we all know this, um, but just kind of briefly talking about what is the most important thing to make sure that our glomerular list works. So uh, we all know um, that um, hydrostatic blood pressure from the capillary is very important as well as oncotic pressure that slowly increases as um, the fluid is uh, filtered. Um, we know that it's important to talk about the area of the glomerular capillary and also the tubular hydrostatic pressure. And so if there's any obstructions uh, downstream that that also can affect our filtration. Um, and then very important, importantly uh, in talking to it about cardiac situations, if your blood flow decreases, there is a compensatory increase in the efferent vascular resistance, particularly mediated by angiotensin, prostaglandins, and renal sympathetic system. 
Um, so API, we all know about this. Um, basically, the big thing that I want to point out on this is prolonged vase constriction of the glomerular arterial for self-centibular necrosis, and then thus causing all of this. Uh, and as we all know, there is an ongoing evolution of the definition, um, and there's multiple uh, ways. Uh, most recent one was the, um, the kidney disease improving global outcomes definitions that kind of ties in all of them. Um, and then we have newer biomarkers. Um, and so this is something uh, I wanted to point out because now with new studies, we are maybe going to be able to diagnose this a little bit um, sooner um, using biomarkers uh, like the NGAL, among others. Um, we continue to use creatinine as one of the markers, but um, just to also point out that urine output is our most um, sensitive uh, marker, and then this can be, um, you know, determined in low resource as high resource settings as well. Um, so in talking about AKI and cardiac surgery, so it's multifactorial, it's complete, incomplete understood. There's some mechanisms that um, have been described, including ischemic reperfusion injury, mechanical blood trauma, oxidative, oxidative stress, venous congestion, and pro-inflammatory cytokine activation, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, big thing is that there, there's a reduction of the mean anterior pressure in the pulsatile flow during um, cardiopulmonary bypass. And so that actually causes necrosis and apoptosis of the tubules and endothelial cells. Um, and then the kidney can only tolerate 60 units of ischemia. And so as soon as the vascular clamps are released, um, that can also lead to reperfusion injury. So it's an activation of uh, these mechanisms of active and necrosis and also reperfusion injury. Um, there's also some thoughts that red cell hemolysis uh, during bypass can also release free hemoglobin and iron that uh, exacerbate oxidant-mediated injury. And then there's an activation by the plastic and all the bypass circuit um, of the neutrophil platelets and cytokines. And then topping it all off, most of these patients are nephrotoxic medications, antibiotics, um, among other things that can make this worse. Um, the incidence, this is quite common. 40% of the children after cardiac surgery can develop a kidney injury, and it is associated with increased morbidity and mortality, particularly prolonged length of stay, need for mechanical ventilation, electrolyte disturbances, and changes in drug metabolism. Um, the incidence is similar in patients with heart failure and ECMO. Um, and then there are some genetic variations that they are starting to describe that make um, some patients more uh, prone to having a kidney injury. Uh, risk factors, so there are some perioperative risk factors, including younger age, longer bypass time, higher surgical complexity and pre-op event um, support, which uh, the bypass time and the surgical complexity were a role in our patient. Uh, intraoperative risks include low blood pressure, um, need for emergent intervention, need for thoracic aortic surgery, and bypass longer than 180 minutes, which most of these also were uh, playing a role in our patient. And then finally, post-op factors, including volume overload and the use of mechanical circulatory support like ECMO uh, were also causes for that too. Uh, renal replacement therapy, um, as we guys mentioned before, fluid overload uh, is associated with increased mortality, and so discussions of using some sort of renal replacement therapy are important. Um, there are some studies that have shown that starting early peritoneal dialysis in neonates improves mortality, um, and also that the peak of fluid overload increased mortality as well. But then, obviously, this depends on the place that you are uh, and the ability to provide this uh, therapy. So outcomes, AKI after bypass is a self-limited complication, usually results between 24 and 48 hours post-op in, in our patient, of course. Um, and so that for this reason, it has been minimized. However, recent uh, research has shown uh, worsening uh, post-op um, in long-term outcomes. And so specifically, um, it's shown that it increases AKI afterwards, it, increase, it increases the need for mechanical ventilation like in our patient. Um, and then this was a very interesting study that I found where uh, moderate and severe AKI was associated with um, five times the risk if it was a um, moderate type and then 10 times the risk of death if it was a um, more severe type. And so I think that's very important to kind of call it out. And then this was uh, stronger than just having very complex um, single surgical physiology or needing uh, mechanical circulatory support. 
And then the other important thing is that um, the patients that survive acute kidney injury are at risk of chronic renal disease, particularly, um, and it's been noted in adults um, as well as in children. So the importance of long-term monitoring as well. So the take-home points for this, um, AKI after critic surgery is common, increases the risk of mortality and other uh, worsening outcomes. Younger age, longer bypass time, and higher surgical complexity increase the risk. Um, options about biomarkers for an earlier diagnosis, as well as uh, monitoring for urine output, which we continue to do, and then a uh, need for a long-term follow-up. And that is all I have. Well, thank you very much, um, Carolina. Again, another fantastic presentation. Um, and now um, we'll have our expert speaker. Um, thank you so much, um, Professor Mignon. So Mignon is um, one of our colleagues, um, who is actually um, in charge of organizing the WIFPIX um, a meeting this, uh, for next year, um, along with a number of um, other colleagues. Um, but Mignon is a full professor and head of the clinical unit of pediatrics nephrology and solid organ transplant at Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital, and a senior lecturer in the, at the University of Cape Town. Um, she is also a pediatrics intensivist and Mignon has worked in the UK and in many other areas. Um, and she has the experience of working in both high income um, situation and she's done a lot of work in low income country, teaching a lot about um, acute renal failure. Um, and Mignon has also developed a wonderful simulation for open pediatrics. So you guys can check that out as well. Um, today, um, Thank you so much. We know Matt Mignon um, had had some a procedure done um, and her Wi-Fi is not great. So we have recorded her talk um, and then we will get to the Q's and A's after. Um, please do drop your questions in um, and then um, we'll get to that at the bottom of the talk. Um, Evelyn, would you mind um, playing Mignon presentation? Thank you. Mignon McCulloch, and I'm going to be speaking to you on dialysis options for acute kidney injury today. I'm based at the Red Cross uh, Children's Hospital in Cape Town, and I'm both a nephrologist and an intensivist. So we know that acute renal failure has changed its name, and it's now called AKI, and the commonest causes in our kind of setting would be fluid-related shock and sepsis. We also see it with drug toxicity, where there's no monitoring, and in many parts of the less well resourced world, the only options are fluzomide and hoping for the best. This often is caused by public health related issues such as clean water, diarrhea, and vomiting. And we know that there's often no easy dialysis in low and middle income countries, even in high income countries, in some neonatal units and in some intensive care units where you may be doing outreach as a teacher, there may not be easy dialysis. So even if you work in a very a highly resourced environment and you have great dialysis facilities, I think you should stay alert because you never know when you may be teaching and helping in an area where there may not be this kind of facility available. So I'm just going to spend a bit of time because we know that there are many definitions and the one definition that we are using on the whole um, is that of the KDGO and it's divided into two columns, one serum creatinine and the other urine output. For me, urine output is the easiest because you can monitor it within six hours and see that there's reduced urine output, stage one, two, or three. A little bit more complicated is that of serum creatinine, um, where you need to actually wait for the creatinine result to come back. But you also need to know what your baseline creatinine is. And for me, that's a problem because if this is the first time the patient is presenting to you, you may not actually have that available. And so both these two markers together are very useful in staging our acute kidney injury. What is really useful is that there's now also even a neonatal AKI definition, similar principles, urine output and serum creatinine, but for the urine output, just slightly different parameters uh, that we would use to diagnose AKI. 
also a paper um, that I managed to get published uh, last year was that the challenges of access to kidney care for children in low resource settings is a very real problem. Often it's a very real problem for adults and even more so for children. And so I'm going to start my lecture off by saying prevention is better than cure. And this is a self-portrait of me, I'm known as a minion. But if we were to ask uh, how much fluid should we give, would we be thinking differently if fluid was considered as an intravenous drug? So the role of fluid after admission is really important, and Stuart Goldstein has done some really very clear work looking at fluid in minus fluid out over your admission weight. This is something that can be done even in the most low resource setting. And uh, once you've diagnosed that, you can then actually work out what percentage fluid overload your patient is. And so we know if you're more than 10%, that's the problem. If you're more than 20%, the chances are that you may need to go on to continuous renal replacement therapy, or as it's now known as kidney renal replacement, kidney replacement therapy. And often we don't know what's actually happened before. Has the patient been dehydrated, or have they actually received a lot of fluid in the casualty or in a a medical or pediatric ward before the patient arrives in a high care or intensive care setting. So, for those of us who work in Africa and India, we are very familiar with this trial that came from the NEJM in 2011, 13 years ago, uh, looking at the mortality after fluid bonuses. It was named the FEAST trial, and Kath Maitland ran with this, and she only does trials with multiples of 3,000 patients. And this looked at either no fluid bolus or saline or albumin as fluid boluses. And if you'd asked most of us, we would have thought maybe the albumin might be a problem. Um, but in actual fact, any fluid bolus turned out to be a problem compared to no fluid bolus in children with severe infection. Obviously, different in cases of shock needing inotropes. But this study made a lot of us sit up and think, what we were specifically doing with fluid. Should we be giving 20 mols per kilo as per the APLS guidelines? Should we be giving 10 mols per kilo as a bolus or even 5 mols per kilo? But really importantly, to examine the patient in between fluid boluses. So there was some work that was done um, and looked at uh, what specifically was the evidence of the analysis. Was it neurological? Was it cardiovascular? Uh, was it related to shock? And so a lot of questions that we're not 100% sure about, um, and could it possibly be the fact that a lot of the children were quite unique, um, specifically from malaria. But what we do know is that conservative therapy or prevention therapy is to not allow fluid overload. Bruzomide has a role. Uh, we tend to give one to two milligrams per kilo per dose as a test dose. I think most of us have moved away from the five to 10 milligrams doses and we also run infusions um, with a maximum of one milligram per kilo per hour. Some people might even run 0.5 or 32. Interestingly we've been doing some clinical research on aminophilin and this seems to be making a comeback as a diuretic in combination with a fruzomide. A single dose or even a one milligram per kilo dose six hourly specifically in neonates but we found this to be quite effective in combination with fruzomide. Now People may say, well, fluzomide doesn't make any difference in the long run. But what, as from a personal experience point of view, it's much easier managing a patient who is at least passing some year than a patient who's completely annual. And then the other important part of your prevention is to make sure that you're not giving nephrotoxic agents in high doses. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are not the pediatrician's drug of choice, as some of the adverts are saying. We would still go with paracetamol for fever. And aminoglycosides such as gentamicin uh, and acacin definitely require drug levels. And if you were to choose, I would choose a trough level rather than a peak level um, to make sure that you're looking after those kidneys. Calcium shifting from a conservative point of view, I think most of you would know this, but if you're teaching to remember to teach people to use calcium as a, as a stabilizer, sodium bicarb, but obviously not given same time as, an, as a drip or as an infusion. Fruzomide and salbutamol nebs are obviously the easy things on most general pediatric wards, no matter where you work. Sometimes we have used intravenous salbutamol. 
caesulate or a, a rhizonium binder seems to be going out of fashion both in adults and in neonates in that there has been some concern about colonic perforation. Uh, but in cases where I've been absolutely desperate, I have on occasion still used caesulate because the one good thing about it is that it actually removes the potassium altogether, but it can take one to two hours to work. And then the controversial issue about insulin and dextrose, uh, there have been some good adult studies done in our, in our city, in Cape Town, showing that your glucose levels are actually pretty high in these patients and the innate insulin levels uh, are actually high as well. And so if you wanted to give anything, give some insulin and dextrose on its own, the worry for me with insulin is often when people forget to monitor the glucose levels and a lot of these children become high glycemic and end up having seizures. So something I don't use very readily. So just to show you some clinical cases, a 10 kilogram boy with presumed sepsis treated with cyclotaxime, cardiac failure, who had non steroidals for a presumed PDA, uh, had further complex cardiac defects that needed surgery and received second line antibiotics of cortez and amicacin. And post op surgery, this patient had no urinary. What did you do in your setting? They did not respond to conservative therapy. What kind of dialysis would you start? Would you start peritoneal? Would you start uh, continuous uh, kidney replacement therapy in the form of other forms of diets? Moving on to the case two. A 3.9 kilogram girl, birth asphyxia, bowel obstruction needing surgery, concern about sepsis, given some amount of blood sign, no urine output, and a potassium of 6.5. Now we know that neonates can cope with a high potassium, but a persistently high potassium can be a problem. And but for these clinical cases, when you looked at the x rays, I think there's no doubt that they were fluid overloaded, big hearts with lungs. And when you actually looked at the ECGs, you can see the potassium. Top on the top graph was quite high at the beginning. You can see some terrifying ECG traces. I'm not sure if that's the patient or if that's the doctor's ECG. And then we can actually look at what is the timing of renal replacement therapy, both PD or CVVH, and there's quite inconclusive evidence about when you start, but the guidance is don't wait too long. And if we look at absolute indications, either severe hyperkalemia, clinical uremia, Acid doses is a big issue, whereas clinical uremia we don't really have much of in kids. And volume overload, as I've mentioned, is also a big issue. And often if you've got a child who's passing just a little bit of urine, very puffy, lots of gut issues, you may need to make space for nutrition. Our relative indications may include some drugs, may include ammonia. So we know that PD is not brilliant for removing ammonia, but if you've got nothing else, if you do something that we have shown removes ammonia, if you've got liver failure, and then temperature control is also a pretty relative indication. So infants and young children, I think most of us would feel more comfortable using peritoneal dialysis, but it's not always possible. And then CBVH or CBHD would be the option. We know there's lots of new technology, and this is a panoramic picture of a patient in our ICU, a big patient, and you can see every single machine that goes ping has actually been rolled to this patient's bedside. So nitric oxide, a ventilator, multiple infusions, a CVVH, a brains monitor, and so the, the list goes on. So if we go back to our two cases, case one was the cardiac. The surgeons put in a PD catheter and it's not working. So what do you do now? Case two was our newborn. PD was attempted, but it's leaking and it's not draining well. So what do you do in this setting? So in our setting, we do have all the bells and whistles. We are now pushing boundaries, even with very small children. Uh, this is a child with an inborn error of metabolism with a very high ammonia. And you have a hemodialysis machine and a CBVH machine at the child's bedside. Um, and we really are pushing boundaries. For many people, uh, the proper DM or the NIDUS or the Aquarius neonatal dialysis machines are now also available. And so when you look at this paper from Ashita Shalwani, you can see that for your continuous renal replacement therapy, there are the options um, of PD or else uh, hemo using scuff or, or sled, as well as continuous uh, reno reno uh, uh, dialysis. And so just starting off with hemofiltration in children, 
a uh, better machine, better lines, so lower climbing volumes. For many years, we just did not have access to equipment that was suitable for small little people. And so not only the lines, but also the catheters. And I must say in the last three or four years, we have now done uh, CVVH probably on at least three children uh, weighing around about 137 kilograms and have done so successfully only because there's now equipment available that's useful for these children. So if you were a beginner, I would say your hemofiltration guide would be your ABC, vascular access, blood pumps, equipment circuits, dialysis prescription, replacement solutions, filters, and anticoagulation. So for me, the most important would be the vascular access. And once again, that's a self-portrait of me because this is the biggest problem. Ideally, a catheter in our setting should be easy to insert. Now, if anybody's put in a catheter into a 1.7 kilogram baby as a pediatric intensivist or nephrologist, I'm going to tell you no line is easy to insert, especially if it's not a five or a six French. It also needs to permit adequate blood flow for the patient's size without damaging the vessels, minimal technical shortcomings, um, and the, this in itself is a big problem. So, Looking at that, we now know that ultrasound guided insertion is now the norm. And I would say that your best option is your internal jugular line. My favorite best is the right side. If you're inexperienced, there is a suggestion that you should use a femoral line, but often there's a big problem with kids spending their legs and kicking around. Subclavians, I would definitely avoid so that can be quite hazardous, especially if you've got a coagulation problem on your patients. So very small, less than three kilograms, maybe a to single lumen lines, or a blue or a yellow um, gauge uh, hemo line, uh, sorry, vascular access line, or a friendly surgeon to assist you with putting in a line. And I'm going to show you my latest updated table. So if you're big, and I'm going to start at the bottom of the table as opposed to the top, more than 15 kilograms, a nine French, or an eight French, or a seven French, a GAM pack um, for anybody under five kilograms. If you're working in Europe and in Africa, if you're working in the North America, there's a new six French uh, barge catheter and a catheter that is not actually a dedicated hemo line, but a central line, a five French short, five centimeters, but that's got two lumens, one of 20 gauge and one of 18 gauges, what we've been using in our ICU recently. The kids under three kilograms work pretty good for this is just a picture of the new um, barred six French catheter that's available in North America and in Europe and in Africa and in India, the GAM catheter is 6.5. It doesn't look that big on this picture, but if you look at the front of the picture, this is a baby, you can see how far that catheter is out. And so this is some of my slides thanks to Quinn Mock and Margaret Farley, uh, renal replacement therapy, you get the stuff. CIVH, CIVHD, CVVH or CVVHD. Um, I think the bottom two are the ones that we are most likely to use. Just a suggestion of blood flow rates in kids. It really depends on your filter performance um, and your efficacy of your CVVH. And then if you're going to be choosing your circuit selection, I love listening to Margaret speak. She makes things really easy. She's actually broken it down into only two kinds of circuits. Those from 2 to 24 kilograms and those over 25 kilograms. So you can see two different um, sizes, but the company does make four different size capital filters. My worry, which is the same with Margaret, is that often your storeroom may not have the different sizes. They may be out of stock, they may be time expired, and so it may just be easier just to store two different size filters as opposed to four ones. So CVVHD prescription, uh, we have a cutaneous machine, but it really depends on what you've got. So priming volumes, important not to have more than 10% of your blood volume outside the child's body. And blood pump speeds, we tend to use three to five moles per kilo per minute. Further prescription, we tend to run for 24 hours a day, but I know some of my colleagues in various less well-resourced countries that run only for eight to 10 hours, so almost like a form of sled, because they just don't have enough staff to keep this running 24-7. Dialysis flow, uh, 25 moles per kilo hour seems to be the acceptable flow rate at the moment. There's some various dialysate 
phoenixes, there's with potassium, there's without potassium, it depends what your indication is for dialysis. And as I said, your fluid flow rate can be starting at one to two, but you can go up to five more per kilo per hour. And important to aim for a neutral that. Again, um, thanks to Poon Mok, um, there's been some work looking at 25 moles per kilo versus 40 moles per kilo in terms of um, effect of ultrafiltration rate, and there's actually no benefit in having an increased intensity. So, this is a multifiltrate solution. So, you can see uh, the potassium free and the, and the with potassium with a decent amount of, of sodium, and obviously your other electrolytes as well. Um, and then the rate of free dilution fluid is a rule of thumb. Uh, the more acidotic, the more volume of free dilution required. Uh, and there's a little example of a 10 kilogram charge of 80 mol per kilo per hour dialysis fluid free dilution, so 800 mol per hour. So, um, also a feeling that if you run some fluid pre filter, you prolong your life of your filter. And then just a little summary of what we use as flow rates. Um, dialyzer priming volumes, line priming volumes, and also then Keprin and dead space. And I haven't really spent much time speaking about the Papa Diem or the Nidus. Uh, these machines really go down to incredibly low rates, um, but this is just a general uh, observation. Then just to chat a little bit about small children and anticoagulation. I know with bigger kids, a lot of units are using citrate. And uh, some liver failure units are using cyclin. But for us, for the little kids, we stuck with heparin, an initial loading dose, and then a continuous dose of 5 to 10 units per kilo per hour. We have an ACT machine at the bedside, but we also send um, our tests to the lab as well, looking at your um, PPT. Uh, we are currently not using citrate or cyclin, but I think when it comes to anticoagulation, you really need to use what makes you feel happy and what you're comfortable with. And then complications. Frequently, if you uh, have a low BP, you may actually need to start some inotrope. Uh, if you have circuit clot, you may need to get some heparin boluses or even fluid boluses. And the one thing that you do need for this form of dialysis is highly skilled and ongoingly motivated personnel because these kids often run into trouble in the middle of the night, and that's when you put it problem. So you can see this is a picture now almost 20 years ago of one of our first machines that we had in a big cardiac kit. Uh, you can see it was the uh, just a blood pump effectively with lots of IVAX uh, and jars at the moment, at the sorry, at the bottom to measure how much ultrafiltration fluid. Really quite challenging, and I must say I spent a large portion of my after hours night at the bedside for these cases. Now there's modern generation machines and it's whatever you feel most comfortable with. Prismaflex is a big one in, in the US and Aquarius um, in the UK. In South Africa we tend to use a lot of convenience, but it really is whatever you like. So as I said, we've now got smaller filters, smaller lines, smaller priming volumes, smaller blood flow ranges, 10 to 100 moles. But for increments, two moles per minute. So I think that really changed enormously um, since uh, we started this campaign. And this is a little patient of ours. Uh, we, as I said, done three or four kids at down to 1.7 kilograms. The copper DM has definitely also changed the landscape, and I know that it's now becoming FDA approved. And you can see here the increments of fluid management is really very good, 0 to 5 moles per minute. Ultrafiltration not to 300 volts. So we do have one of these machines, very, very uh, small and precise, a little bit temperamental, but it really is well worth it when you've got a tiny little bit to dialyze. And if you compare the personal flex to the three circuits on the carpet DM, you can see your ultrafiltration rate. But importantly, if you look at your priming volume, this is your circuit plus your voltage, you can see down to 27 volts, which is amazing. Just to show the machine in action, uh, you can do it through a four French double lumen central line in the groin, or you can do it through two 24 gauge um, vent lines. And what's important about this machine is that it has peristaltic pumps, so there's very low risk um, of hemolysis. And this is a picture of the machine 
two or three years ago when we first got it. And very nice paper recently um, out of pediatric nephrology in June of this year, looking at the outcome in 38 patients, and they suggest that they've had excellent survival. In the UK, the NIDUS, uh, Malcolm Coulthard's machine, um, also a very precise, very small ultrafiltration volume. And again, each machine has its own uh, issues and its own knowledge base that you need. And if you're looking for a good neonatal support course, I'm going to advertise David Asinazi's course. Uh, recently attended one of it, really good. Um, just nice to be putting our heads together when it comes to kidney support in the other. So when we looked at this chart the first time around, we went down the CRT or CKRT route. Now I'm going to just look at the PD route. And we know that this very nice international pediatric survey done some years ago, now 2017, showed that um, AKI in developing and developed countries, and you can see here um, in Asia, in India, there was uh, quite a few countries that responded, that PD is available in all centers. Um, so KRT or CRT, 60% of um, highly resourced, 33% of less highly resourced, um, but importantly, PD is available everywhere. And so if you look at the availability, this is um, highly resourced, this, uh, sorry, this is low resource, highly resource, 100% on both. But if you look at CRT, only 33% of developing countries um, and 60% of high income countries. So definitely uh, there is room for PD, especially if you don't have a lot of support and sense So going back to this patient, the cardiac, so we would have started this patient on PD in our center. Similarly, with this newborn, we would have done the same. It's quick and easy. We do it at the bedside here. You can see a little cook catheter, or you can send the patient to theater for a proper tank off and a central line if you need that. So the gold standard from the new PD guidelines for acute kidney injury that I'm going to give you the reference for in a second um, is that if you can transfer the child to a pediatric kidney center, do so. Else, try and get a surgeon to put in a tank off. But if you still can't do that, no one should die without having an attempt of bedside PD. And if you can do an acidic tap, you really can do a bedside PD tap. The practicalities, we start with small volumes, 10 to 20 mils per kilo. We adapt it to the ventilatory requirement. Dialysis fluid, you can either use lactate buffer, dianeal, or bicarb buffer. The problem with Bicavera's storage is a problem and it expires quite quickly and it's expensive. We tend to go for three strengths, weak, medium, and strong. They differ a little bit in each country. But we've also taught people how to use homemade solution ringers and pickles and dextrose if you've got nothing else. And the concept is a full, a dwell, and a drain cycle, 10 minutes, 30 to 90 minutes, and 20 minutes. So somewhere between an hour and two hours per cycle. If you don't have any dialysis um, fluid, we've actually also taught that ring of lactate works by adding um, dextrose to that. And adding to that dextrose um, can make three different strengths. Uh, really importantly is the concept of sterility of PD. So if you can't take the patient to theatre, we say bring theatre to the bedside. COVID has taught us that we should really be uh, using sterile techniques, PPE. Um, so really important, as you can see in this uh, picture, sterility. Um, also remember to empty the bladder, get someone to manage the airway, give some sedation with local anesthetic, and use um, artificial, make artificial societies with some saline ringers um, before you actually insert the catheter. Now, PD fluid prescription uh, adjustments. If you fluid overloaded, you may increase the sugar solution. If you have too high a potassium, you may want to increase your frequency of your cycle, so ensuring a potassium pre solution. Additives, we add heparin to most of our dialysis bags, and we always make sure the patient gets a dose of antibiotics before we insert a bedside PD catheter or send the patient to get. If you've got a neonate or somebody in liver failure, a bicarbonate based solution is obviously a lot better, um, and we don't worry too much about the lactate in the ring of lactate. It gets, it gets converted. 
So looking at the art of medicine, PD catheters are multiple. So you can use cannulas, chest drains, nasogastric tubes, central lines, stick catheters, peel away tincocks, or multi-purpose catheters. So here's a picture of all of them. This is a central line, and you may want to use an adult central line or adult renal line PD catheter. These are the two cook catheters which have now been discontinued. This is a proper tank off that a surgeon would insert. This is the rigid stick catheter or Romson's catheter. From this, it has a very sharp point. And if you've got a tiny neonate, you may even just want to start with a venous catheter. So the new generation cook catheters are multi purpose and pigtail, and they're actually very easy to insert by solving a technique. If you've got a child over a year of age, you may actually want to change to the Kimmel peel away tank off. And this, you actually uh, insert the needle, put the guide wire into the needle seldinger, you then take the needle out and you put this trocar and dilator over the wire, you pull the dilator out, leaving you with this white uh, plastic uh, cannula and you then peel it away and it leaves your uh, PD catheter inside you. This is a picture somebody sent me from the Philippines, an adult uh, hemoline being used as a neon, in a neonate as a PD catheter, and you have your in and your out ports. So we use manual dialysis for kids under 5 kilograms with a fluid warmer. You can make it yourself, or you can buy the ready-made self-constituted catheters, either from some of the companies, Fresenius or Baxter, and you can see how you put them together. You could say this is low tech, but in many of our cases, such as this little cardiac, a lot of cardiac surgeons put in the PD catheter in at the time of surgery. You can see here nitric oxide and oscillate, the multitudes of um, inotropes. So this is not really a low tech system, but we have also used the automated dialysis machine from time to time. It's a bit cheaper, over five kilograms, and this is a child who had hemolytic uremic syndrome, and it works very well because it actually gives the nurses free hands and you can use this continuously for 24 hours. Just going to spend a little bit of time speaking about continuous flow PD. Um, so this is something that Pete North has spent a lot of time in our unit developing. And there have been some studies in adults, not that many studies in kids, but it really is a very useful system. You would put in two PD catheters um, a little way apart from each other. And you would then, in the past, we used to use a BM25 or we used to fill, have a full volume, an inflow and an outflow, with the outflow just being slightly faster than the inflow so that the abdomen didn't overextend or over distend. We would also do a bladder pressure um, and we would make sure that the intra abdominal pressure did not go up by more than 10. And we found that. With CFPD, it improves ultrafiltration clearance. It's safe. It is quite technologically heavy, especially if you're going to try and fiddle with the machine and the pumps are quite expensive. And so currently there's research happening looking at a simpler way of doing CFPD with gravity, which can be used in low-income countries. And here's a picture of um, Pete Norse with Stefano Picker and Tim Bunchman looking at a CFPD system by gravity in our own institution. So we've done a lot of training in South Africa for over 50 fellows from across Africa, um, specifically in pediatric pathology, um, and that led us to also realize that we need to train teams of people. And so a collaboration of uh, IPNA, ISN, ISPD, and uh, EuroPD has formed the Saving Young Lives program. Uh, we have um, a course which happens once a year in Cape Town, uh, which is a week long, it's a residential course and it needs teams of doctors and nurses. This is now spread to India, but also to Central America. And you can see just in Africa, how many centers have had this week long course. We specifically concentrate on uh, teaching people how to put in bedside uh, PD catheters, but we also go into the whole prevention of AKI and the management in a semi-ICU setting. We also teach people together in teams that learning is fun, and we teach them how to do dialysis, manual dialysis, as well as automated dialysis. And as I said earlier, we train teams of people, both doctors and nurse teams from all over the country. 
we have now also started these courses in the French part of, of Africa and Asia as well as Central America. And then if you remember nothing else about this talk, I think really important to look at the newly published ISPD guidelines for PD and AKI. This is actually for highly resourced countries as well as less well resourced countries. We go through the gold standard, so getting a surgeon or transferring a child to a renal unit, all the way through to what acceptable um, uh, systems can you use if you've got nothing else available. So look up this article, it is free, it's got Norse as first author and me as last author, and it addressed some issues like, for example, the use of locally constituted dialysis fluid if you don't have dialysis fluid. This is from an adult study in Cameroon. If you look at the peritonitis rate, 16% in commercial solution, 16% in locally made solution. So very similar. Uh, we duplicated this in a pediatric study at our hospital as well as in the DRC with very low peritonitis rates, uh, less than 4%, uh, making sure that you use sterile technique uh, when you constitute the fluid as well as when you insert the PD catheter. And if you were to ask me as a intensivist, what would be my changes in my practice in Africa? I'd say with a three way tap, uh, you can actually improvise anything. And with the bureau trial, you can actually measure anything. And so if you look at the next slide, this is a ringer's lactate with dextrose that's been added to it. Um, with a three-way tap in the middle and a nasogastric tube that's got some extra holes. So something like this can be life-saving if you don't have any other form of that. And these are slides sent by various colleagues across the world. This is the stick catheter. If you've got nothing else, that's an option. A cavity drainage catheter, an adult central line, uh, you can use as a PD catheter, um, and any system that has a cell in it. We use this knowledge to teach at many of the renal as well as intensive care congresses where we're teaching hands-on. This is my colleague Ashley Patsia teaching using a tin foil baking tray and some cling wrap how to put in a PD catheter. Our colleagues that we've trained in Africa, so Professor Antri has gone back to Ghana and not only has he dialyzed patients in his own hospital, but he's also taught people in the community when they have failed in conservative management of AKI, how to put in bedside PD catheters within the community if they can't transfer the patient. So are there any benefits of COVID? Well, as a South African at the moment, I feel possibly not, um, but there have been benefits in that uh, virtual training has really become much more possible. So Boston Children has got a uh, open pediatrics syllabus for PD as well as for HEMO, and I was fortunate enough to be part of this. We've also had multiple webinars, and this is one that I did with Siddharth Seti and Fesh Rain and Tim Bunchman, um, looking at uh, any issues related to clinical care pathology. And so the one good thing about having much more virtual educational modules available is that we can get this information to everybody across the world. But at the end of the day, whether you've got a patient who's had PD or CBVH or AKI, which is then after a month become acute kidney disease and after three months become chronic kidney disease and ended up on long-term dialysis, these patients, very few fortunately, but there are some, would then go on to need a kidney transplant. And I'm just going to do the last part of my talk on a few little unusual concepts about kidney transplantation in less well resource centers, which I thought might be of interest to you. So we know that the impact of poverty, many parts of Africa, patients come from very deprived backgrounds, also many other regions around the world, Asia, South America. And if you look at this interesting world according to transplant activities from 2010, in orange are the countries where there's a lot of transplant activity, Gray is where there's a medium amount of transplant activity, but blue is where there's hardly any. And if you look, Africa's virtually disappeared. Asia has really improved, but Central and South America has also got um, not that many centers that are actually doing dialysis. If you're preparing for a transplant in the same way as you're preparing to go to the Olympic Games, if you're a top athlete, you better 
train, the better your outcomes are. And so it's all about good preparation. If you've got a less well-resourced region, you may only have one chance at getting a kidney transplant, and so really important to try and prepare as best you can. Issues that we encounter in less well-resourced countries include cultural, like brain death regulations, which may not be available. So currently in Africa, South Africa is one of the few countries that has brain death regulations. Also, organ donation numbers are decreased. There are also um, religious and cultural beliefs, for example, that the body needs to return intact to the ancestors, so all kidneys and organs must be there. And then also some issues, for example, fathers to daughter donations are often not very common. Add to that the financial situation where if you've got a donor who's off work for six to eight weeks, there may be no food for the family for that entire time, and you can understand why the organ donation is a challenge. And so the management of AKI is really, really vital in this setting. A few other transplant issues I just want to go through, and that includes government and legislature, um, living related, deceased donor, and living non related is what we have in our country, and we have a government committee who decides that. Uh, we have pediatric priority listing, but that may not be the situation in many other countries. If you look at organ trafficking versus transplant tourism, it is a worldwide trade. In South Africa, we did have issues with that in the beginning, and then we signed the Declaration of Istanbul, making sure we try and avoid this altogether. And the patients in Africa um, still go elsewhere. Both adults and kids may go to India and to China, often with their donors. It's so important to make sure that organ trafficking and transplant tourism is separate. From an ICU point of view, commemorating the organ donors. So in theatre, often there's a minute to loot for the donor. Um, there's also uh, the uh, donor march where you walk from ICU and you line the corridors and the donor gets sent to theatre. And then many countries have a, a, a multi-religious commemoration of donor ceremony. We have it in South Africa in August. And it's a multi-denominational, multi-religious service where we actually uh, give thanks for donors and their families. And then just to move to pediatric aspects of renal transplant allocation, this is from Germany, looking at your kidney allocation systems. The top four would be scoring systems, HLA matching, recipient age and hyperimmunization, together with duration on the waiting list and time of dialysis. Um, international peace transplant, I've just stepped down as the past president, and uh, we will be looking at an allocation problem project across the world to see if there's pediatric priority list. To know what's really going on, you need a transplant registry, and most highly resourced countries already have this. South Africa, we've got the only African registry, but we will be trying to roll this out across Africa, and you can only know what to do and what to plan for your transplant patients if you know what is happening globally. And then just a few other issues um, in less well-resourced countries, and I want to thank Arkana Iyenga from Bangalore for sharing this slide with me, in that often few transplant programs, rarely a preemptive transplant where a patient can avoid dialysis, not great donors, and a weak deceased organ program. Also, children are managed in adults, units, suboptimal urology expertise. Often they come to us quite late with poor growth and lots of infections and diagnostic limitations. <clears throat> Add to that the late detection of end-stage renal disease with the difficulty reaching a center, the fact that the parents have to pay for this out of their pocket and there's no government support. Um, also, trading, medical tourism, as I've explained, teenage adolescents, and transfer of care. So those are the big issues that we struggle with in transplantation. Less than ideal donors, lots of infections that you know about, but then malaria, HIV, and TB may be infections you're not familiar with. Donors, parents, and aunts and uncles, hypertensive, poor matching, and older age. And then there have even been some situation where positive HIV parents have donated their organs to their children. And I guess if you were in that situation and you had no other option, this is something you would consider as well. Immunosuppression. Often we get referrals from elsewhere in Africa for surgery. You've got to ask, is this the right donor? Is this really a living related donor? Often when they go back to their countries, those immunosuppression drugs are just not available. Or which ones are available? What drug monitoring is available? Where are they done? So often they've flown down to Johannesburg 
only done once a month was the quality control lab. So if you don't have the drugs available, is it really fit that you be doing transplants? Lots of inspections, as I've mentioned earlier, much more of a problem, and this is from Arvind Bagas group in Delhi. Uh, we recently had a very nice paper presented by one of our Zimbabwean fellows looking at TB in our patients and how there's definitely a decrease in TB if we use INHS populace. And then just looking at um, COVID, so in the beginning we thought it was less of an issue in pediatric transplant patients, but we've now had two deaths of 14 year olds within the first three months of transplant. A lot of our adult facilities have halted their transplant programs in particular at the time of COVID wave. Pediatrics, we've had more impact on general pediatric issues such as return to school, immunization and nutrition, as well as access to transplant medication. Also, what happens with the care to the carers if they get sick, who's going to be looking after them? The patients, and then we've had all the multi-inflammatory syndromes as well. So just ending with personalized medicine with artificial intelligence, even the most challenged economically, economically challenged person, Africa, Asia, South America has a mobile phone. How do we use this technology? How do we adapt it? The imagination is limitless. So the future of critical care and renal support is precision or dynamic kidney replacement therapy, even for kids, possibly inline sensors for urea nitrogen measurement. What is the exact timing of initiation, demand versus capacity imbalance? Can we use biomarkers and so renal angina um, using NGAL by Stuart uh, Goldstein, as well as the Ninja systems for neonates? Also looking at fluid overload, can we prevent this? And what kind of anticoagulation are we doing? So my take home messages are that prevention should be the first priority, that no patient should um, die of AKI without at least an attempt at dialysis, if not PD, and at least using homemade fluid and improvised catheters if you've got nothing else. Neonates, I think, are a specific group of challenges, but now we've got machines and lines and filters that are being created specifically for these kids. You can make a difference wherever you are, even if you work in a highly resource center and you don't teach in a low resource center. Uh, you are making a difference. If you're working in a middle or low resource center, you are definitely making a difference to these patients, even if you are using improvised techniques. So don't forget about AKI. I would definitely, I feel very passionate about it, and I feel that a lot can be prevented. So the good news for Africa is we've trained lots and lots of fellows. These are our current fellows that have just qualified as pediatric nephrologists. And I really want to thank my team at Red Cross. Um, both my nephrology team as well as the intensive care team because without a team of people you can't do this. I'd love to invite you to the WIFIX in July, I'm not sure if it's going to be in person or virtual or hybrid, but the conference is definitely going to happen. Some really exciting topics to be discussed and some really good workshops. But before this, with a bit of luck, in March in Prague, I'd like to invite you to the International Peace Transplant Congress. Um, which I'm busy organizing. So thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to any discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Mignon. Um, I hope, and I'm sure everyone has enjoyed that um, session. Um, I'll pass the question over to my colleagues, Sebastian and Emily. Over to you guys. Okay, we could have start now. So many questions have been answered already in the chat box. I have an open question for everyone, particularly for those like Fatila, who are working in low middle income countries. Regarding, uh, what do you think about in those places which do not have uh, dialysis capacity or Apology teams, you know, what would be, in your experience, the first steps to start a basic renal replacement therapy team within the hospitals? For example, how, what would be the first steps to start a peritoneal dialysis program, for example? Something like that. Uh, from my experience, I think. Uh... 
first, uh, things like PD catheter, uh, PD um, peritoneal dialysis are easy to adapt. And uh, maybe the first step will be just to train uh, people in the area in different facilities on how to operate and how to do the PD catheters before introducing them in the facilities first. So, yeah. Usha, any um, additional information? And then we can ask Carolina. Um, we, most of the times we don't use PDs unless they are infants or someone. We are more trying to use this intermittent hemodialysis as CRFDs in our unit. Mignon, what do you think? How would you guide somebody um, uh, places that don't have this? Uh, how, do, how would you start? So I would start by reading the guidelines that we've just published and having them printed out or stuck on your wall because it really covers all eventualities from the most advanced center, which may not be used to using PD and may end up having to do that, to a center that has nothing and needs to, to do that. Um, Saving Young Lives has really started spreading out across the world. So we've had, been running workshops in India Ironically, I've been to Kenya five times and you've got five brilliant pediatric nephrologists who do a lot of training and teaching at your Kidney uh, Pediatric Association and your, kidney, uh, your Kenyan Renal Association. So I think having videos and um, ISN and IPNA are the two big renal organizations and they actually have some of our videos now online. So as I said, COVID has done a, made us much wiser in distance learning. In the past, I would have said you'd have to travel to come for a workshop, but there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of stuff online and maybe WFPIX and this group need to actually combine all the resources that are available, um, almost like a toolbox that people can actually type into um, and actually look at and, and do. and. I'm just going to leave you with a thought that if you can do an ascites tap, then you can do PD. Um, and I always say, don't let a child die of acute kidney injury because you're too scared to try some PD. And we don't extubate kids because they've got pneumonia, do we? So why do we not want to do PD because they might get peritonitis? And so they're drugs to treat peritonitis with, either intravenous or into the bag. And we've actually even got those in our guidelines as well. So um, do what you do best. I'm not saying if you're doing ECMO and it's very smart C kidney renal replacement therapy, don't stop and convert everybody to PD. But at the same time, I think PD is something that many of the senior guys did very well in the past. And now a lot of junior people don't because we're not taught it. Um, so I think what I'm saying is AKI is manageable. Definitely, I've seen lots of chats in the group about preventing it. So don't fluid overload your kids. Don't give them 120, 150 mils per kilo daily. Um, resuscitate them 10 mils per kilo at a time. And then once you've resuscitated, cut that fluid right back to try and prevent doing PD, any dialysis of any description. So, and I just want to thank the speakers. They did a brilliant, brilliant job. I've commented in the chat uh, box to, to each of them. Um, but I think my ultimate take home message is acute kidney injury anywhere in the world can be prevented. But once you've got it, it can also be managed um, by all the different techniques. So thank you to everybody for listening. It's been a long session um, and still to have 74 people just means that we've obviously hit the right spot. So well done on the people for putting this together, the brain children. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mia. And um, we will have a recording of the session on the WIFPIX Wif website, and maybe we can connect with you and put the um, um, the resources that you mentioned um, on the website also. Um, I know we're already over time, uh, but if we have any sort of last few burning questions, we will try to address them. Um, I don't see any hands up right now, but one question that I saw earlier on that I don't think we addressed is um, somebody asked, um, how would you um, manage um, 
some of the drugs that were mentioned, I think amikacin and gentamicin, uh, if you don't have any ability to um, check drug levels. Maybe you addressed it, but I didn't see that, Mignon. That's really hard. I, I really struggle with that. And I think then it's time for advocacy. So combine with your adult colleagues, and I've just put in the chat group, make friends with your nephrologist, but make friends with your adult colleagues as well. So if you in your hospital can collaborate with your adult intensivist, adult nephrologist, physicians, and yourselves, and advocate to your hospital to at least just do one set of drug levels. And I would actually go for trough, because that's what's going to kill your kidneys. And if you're really in doubt, I would even just give a single dose, because amikacin and Genta are cheap, they're easily available and they really are brilliant antibiotics. So um, we try and then give a dose and then monitor the level 24 hours later. Uh, but I think if you don't have it, then it's time to maybe advocate that it's something your laboratory starts. And and part of what WFPICS and the various nephrology networks should be doing is advocating for children's health and for facilities. So definitely would put that out there. And remember that aminoglycosides gives you a polyuric renal failure. So you may not realize that you're actually in AKI because you're peeing a lot. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Mignon. Um, I think we um, are almost half an hour over time. <laughs> um, so Sorry, guys. unless there are any <laughs> long talk. No, no. Uh, and this is an excellent talk. Thank you so much. Um, unless you have any other burning questions. Um, I, I, I was just going to ask Sebastian because um, he mentioned that they use the PD for every single thing um, in Uruguay. Uruguay. Um, do you see a lot of hemodynamic instability in your patients? Um, and what sort of criteria do you use um, in commencing your PD? How early do you start? Well, we use, it is a, the most important uh, technique here in Uruguay. Besides that, we, we have hemodialysis capability as well, but I think for most patients, for most general PICU patients, PD is great. I mean, it is undervalued uh, today at the, at the time where fashion machines and so are more available for PICUs. But I, we don't have really, I mean, we have per, peritonitis, yes, that uh, complication, but, but it's, they are almost uh, really manageable, you know? And I, I was thinking, I mean, one of the most important uh, key points, which are uh, um, problems, which are both in both uh, high income countries and low income countries is fluid overload. So I, I think that the most important thing is try, try to prevent it before it happens. One, the, once the fluid is in the body, it's, it's the same, the outcome if you get it out. So I, I, I have a, a last open question for you all is how do you manage to try to prevent and be uh, warned in your PICUs this kind of uh, try to, to spot on which are, uh, which are those children at risk? How do you manage to, to try to start PD, for example, fast in a timely fashion way? Carolina, do you want to start? Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna start. So um, I think that's a great question. Um, I think what we do here in the cardiac ICU is we set a total fluid volume. I think we were just biased because they're cardiac, so we definitely give them less volume regardless. Um, and then that we keep a very close eye. So we usually start at um, lower total fluids, 60 to 80 mils per kilo per day. Um, in the PICU, we are not as stringent, but uh, we do keep tabs of the ins and outs, and the nurses do a spectacular job doing that uh, for us. And so, um, but I, I do still feel that we do give fluid freely, and um, it is challenging, um, and it always is an issue later on when they're fluid up for whatever disease. So, um, 
yeah, I, I, I don't. And then in regards to the PD, um, I think Emily kind of pointed out to that. So our surgeons here like to wait a couple of weeks, sometimes a week or two before using the PD catheter. Um, and so sometimes it, it can be a little challenging to start that instead of uh, using the other modality. Um, and so, yeah, that's been my experience in training. And Mignon, I think you wanted to say something. I just wanted to make a, a point that it's important to differentiate acute PD from chronic PD. So chronic PD, we wait two weeks before we start. Our surgeons put it in, laparoscopic obentectomy, all bells and whistles, little bow on the end of the, and you know, a gold star on the head. For acute PD in our ICU, we do it ourselves or our surgeons do it, but we try not to make large incisions. We try and do cell dinger technique like you would do with a central line. If it leaks, we try and use glue, so surgical glue, or even uh, purse strings, but we use acute PD straight away. So important that people don't leave this meeting with the, the confusion between chronic and acute um, PD. So I completely agree. For chronic, we wait two weeks. You're not allowed to even start PD before that, but for acute, you need to start and early. It's urgent. Your potassium, my top limit was a potassium of 13. We started PD within 20 minutes. So you don't have two weeks to wait. So good points. Excellent. Um, maybe uh, Dr. Usha, do you have any thoughts on um, how to recognize volume overload early in your unit? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Basically, in our unit, we follow something called ROSE strategy. So unless any child is actively oozing or losing the volume from uh, external, like to the external environment, we don't usually give more of fluids to the child, even if they are very sick. So basically, we use ultrasound a lot in our unit. So in ER also, we'll be uh, managing the children with ultrasounds. So unless the child comes, any child with massive trauma, massive bleedings or hypovolemia, those kind of children where we give a lot of fluids. Otherwise, the moment if the child is, we start them on one or two boluses, straight away we use the ultrasound, we see how the cardiac contractility, we see the IVC volume, so we directly go ahead with inotropes. So that is one point. But uh, in, even in PICU also, when the child is on ventilator, we just give the fluids enough to maintain the sugars and the electrolytes. So it's not like 40%, 50%, it's again based on each and every child. So if the cardiac contractility is poor, we restrict the fluids even to 50% also. If the child with sepsis in those children, we restrict to 75 to 80% maybe. And we'll be keeping a close watch on urine output. Every maybe, like if the child is very sick, maybe for four hours, once in six hours, we will be calculating and we'll be seeing how much the child is accumulating the fluid and how much is the cumulative fluid balance. So once the child is stabilized and we immediately uh, will be waiting. So when the child will go for the evacuation phase, the final thing is evacuation phase. If any, most of the times if we will be seeing children with dengue shocks. So dengue shocks, usually the children will come with a lot of hemodynamic instability where we have to give a lot of fluids. The moment they are going for the recovery phase, so we will be continuously monitoring them, the hemodynamics, the platelets going up. So that, that is the time where we have to evacuate the fluids. So we will see whether the child is spontaneously diurosing. If not, we use most of the times if the child is hemodynamically kind of okay, stable with IVC showing good volume and uh, heart contact rate is good with uh, normal volume state. So we start LASIKs in most of our children. If they are hypovolemic without any renal injury and uh, maybe uh, like heart problems, then we may add like if it are, they are hypoalbuminemic, we may add albumin also to that. But mostly we will try to manage with LASIKs infusions. Unless if, if any child, like if the fluid overload per se is causing hemodynamic compromise to the child, we don't go for the replacement therapist because again, it's a cost uh, limiting factor. So any child who, where we have to remove more and more fluids, and if the child is having other associated problems like inotropic requirement and like dyselectrolytemia and metabolic acidosis, there we go for. If it is a in, if the child is in infantile age group, we start peritoneal dialysis. Most uh, we don't call the surgeons; we only insert the PD catheters, and we will prepare the fluids ourselves and we will start with the PD. If the child is related in the uh, like more than infantile age group, we go with CRRTs and CRRT again if the Cost is a uh, limiting factor, means we try something. If the sensorium is fine, there is no evidence of cerebral edema, then we will start with intermittent hemodialysis or slide. 
And if the child is not fitting for any of these criteria, we arrange the funds somehow by all the crowdfundings and all those things, and we go for CRRT using Prismaflex. I hope that was very helpful. Thank you. Great. Um, so maybe one closing comment, um, Fadila. How do you how do you um, uh, figure out or prevent fluid overload in in your unit? So most of the times we don't have uh, specific guidelines to control the fluid overload. It has it has always been a big problem in, in the past, but currently we normally um, calculate the fluid balances, and if it's too much positive, we normally give um we either diurese or or something like that. But for patients who have risk of developing AKI, especially septic shock, the patient who uh, we admit frequently in our unit, normally we don't give the full maintenance fluids, but rather we replace the losses more and um, yeah, try to maintain a tight range, but not too much positive fluid balances. Excellent. Thank you everybody so much. Um, thank you to all of our amazing speakers. Um, this was an amazing session. I, I learned a lot from all of you and I'm, I'm very impressed how you are all managing um, acute kidney failure in these different resource settings. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I feel really stupid in high income countries because we feel so removed. I've, I've, I've never placed a PD catheter myself. So um, this is really amazing. You, you, taught, you taught me a lot. Um, uh, thank you Minya for your, for your excellent talk. Um, that was really amazing. And um, again, I learned a lot. Uh, I would like to um, make sure you all know that we're trying to do these sessions um, with um, sort of a three month frequency. So if um, either you are a fellow um, in pediatric critical care and would be interested in presenting a case like our three um, great fellows today, or if you are a faculty member and you have fellows who might be interested, please contact us, uh, contact Zaf or myself. Um, and uh, we try to have uh, uh, fellows present from various uh, resource settings. So um, we try to make a mix. And um, again, thanks everybody. Um, thank you um, all your participants who stuck with us to the very end, despite us going over time. Um, and have a nice rest of your day and night, depending where you are. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Nice to meet you. Bye. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. See you in Cape Town. Yes. See you there. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Thanks, Evelyn, so much. Bye bye. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.